conditions today. If Greg and I are gonna, if we say you're gonna be cutting on this side of the prop, your fire is out beyond the block wall, let's say, past the minivan. Okay, if you're gonna cut that side of the prop and you're coming from this side, you're gonna come up the stairs as your ladder, you're gonna go to that corner, you're gonna do your inspection cut in that corner, and then you will come back here to the main beam and you will drop your smoke indicators um, appropriately where you should. Okay, just the opposite of that. If we're gonna have you cut this side, you're gonna go to that corner, do your inspection, come back, travel down the main beam, drop your smoke indicators in the appropriate spots. Where do the smoke indicators have to be on a panelized roof? Fire side of what? Beams and purlins. They've got to be, or they're doing you no good. Do you understand that? This glue lamp beam is a fantastic fire stop. You will get rapid and aggressive fire movement coming down this rafter span, it will stop at that three foot deep beam until it builds enough to come underneath. So I can have a going good fire on this side and get very little if any smoke out of this side. I've been there, okay? So make sure it is fire side of beams and purlins. And I also recommend that you do them very organized. Don't just randomly drop your smoke indicators. They're your breadcrumbs back to where you're, where you're, back to your ladder, where you came from. Make them organized. I teach and preach that er, that they go fire side in the corner of every beam and purlin, right in the corner, four inches off the purlin. Okay, so it'll be right here. It'll be right here. It'll be right here if the fire's out there. So that after we ventilate, let's say we're ventilating, we've opened our hole, shit's going bad, we need to beeline it back to the aerial. I could turn back 50 feet, I could see where my purlins are because I got all those smoke indicators. We might even be at a jog to get off the roof quickly and we know where to run, okay? Also that lets, also that lets my sawyers know where all the purlins are and they're not guessing. Because if you've been on this roof before when it's comped and you've done an operation or you've trained, Sawyers are going to have to step, they're going to have to dip in and step on roof and they may not know where to go. Okay, so those, those organized smoke indicators give them an idea of where to stand. Okay, all right. Sorry, Greg. Let's, let's work. Hey, one more, one more thing about the, smoke, about the smoke indicators. Everybody take your hand and write a capital letter with your finger. Okay, that's how you do a smoke indicator. And you're just taking the saw and I go out, down, over, punch. I never change hands, I never cut into my body, I never cross hands, capital A, right? Away, down, over. Quick, simple, efficient, all right? Come on, Tuffy. Okay, I'm gonna sound Greg over this side, we're gonna be going over there. I'm gonna sound him out here. I'm gonna do what he's gonna do his inspection hole, I'm still not even sounding, I just found a purlin here, because I knew I was on a beam there. This inspection cut is prop driven. We are not advocating doing your inspection cut in the corner of a building right on the bearing wall. Everybody understands that, right? Real world scenario, if I was going over there to ventilate, I would have Greg out in here somewhere doing his inspection. And let's say this roof continued to the west, past this beam, I would probably have him cut it right here or right here, where we could identify the beam and beams and purlins as well, okay? All right, so we get an inspection done. What do we got? Hold rafters, two feet. Rafters, two feet off center. Okay, we'll come back to here. Beam. We're traveling down. He's dropping his smokes. Fire side. Every time I come to a beam, I sound it at two foot and four foot. I'm going to hit here. I'm going to hit here. I hit here. I hit here. Purling. That's the on because we're going to be masked up. He's going to tap, slide, and point to me. I then understand building construction with him. I realize that's a purlin. Drop my skate. Drop this one. Two, four. Two, four. Purlin. Damn, if these guys behind me don't get what our roof construction is after me doing that twice, I've got significant issues, right? And an inspection hole. The reason that I sound out to four feet is because I just know that when we're up here doing an operation, 
after my Sawyer's have cut and the hooks are stepping up the louver, the Sawyer's got to go somewhere. I don't want them to ever tuck into, back up on, step onto a part of the roof that has not been sounded. So I want to make sure that they know that every purlin coming out that beam we traveled, they could dip in as deep as four feet. They could both stand right here and then wait for us and that first hook can then lead them off. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. All right, still coming out. Purlin. Okay, we're gonna go out this beam for our operation. This here is a decision point for you. And, I'll, and we will go through this again tomorrow. But if we have made a decision that we're gonna ventilate here, and we've done that because we've determined fire conditions. Maybe we have a skylight that's lit off. Maybe we see whirly birds. We've been dropping our smoke indicators and now we're starting to get some smoke coming out. Maybe it's mildly pressurized. Maybe it's, mod it's moderately pressurized. For me, my trigger point is if I get moderate pressurized smoke and I feel it and it's warm, that's where I'm going to cut. If I get to the point where I'm getting dark pressurized smoke and it's hot, I'm too close. Remember, off beam, space for time. What is the amount of space for time we're recommending you give? Two spans, 16 feet, very good. So we're talking about the fire actively being at about where the tilt up wall is. Copy that. If you feel more comfortable with going another eight back, then go another eight back, okay? But at this point, I make a decision. I, I would like to give myself a heads up. <clears throat> so even if your crew is all gonna operate on this purlin, I would send two guys out to this point and have them drop another one here. If you're gonna be doing an offensive louver, which I'll teach you tomorrow, where you have a two person crew on that purlin, a two person crew on this purlin, and they're cutting all this out, I would have this fireside pair go another eight feet and drop a smoke, okay? Because we should be visualizing, the two hooks should be visualizing all of our smoke indicators. And if we're halfway, if we've got two louvered, and when my plan is to go the other two and do a 16 foot opening, and after we louver or get the first two cut, I'm seeing fire out of that, that smoke indicator eight feet away. It's either, hey guys, game on, get this thing done, or we're, let's, just, let's just drop it and pull back. Let's abandon this hole and drop back another 16 and go again. Make sense? Okay, all right. We're coming out this early. All right, at this point here, if you were not at a bearing wall, then I have, I have more options of where, me, where I as the hook can go. If this is just a beam and the roof continues, I could just continue down the purlin, but I can have Greg cut here. If I'm at a bearing wall, I can bump back down the beam, correct? I personally do not have any issues with stepping past him. You may have some skippers that do. There may be some other cadre members that do. You may not be a personally a fan of that. But for me, I don't have an issue. I am not a fan of flip-flopping tools here. There are agencies out there that do that. We would right now change tools, and not only do I get to do the bitch and sounding, I do the bitch and cutting. He, gets, he doesn't get better at anything, okay? If you make the decision to bump around him, it's a basically a one-step deal. I'm gonna sound where I'm going, my outside foot goes out, my inside foot goes back, and it's freaking fast. You're not, you're not taking a picnic out here on the, on the Raptors, all right? Okay, um, this, this hole that we're gonna do right now, we're basically gonna be louvering a three by three in reality, okay? So these three by three openings, this really should not be your, your first choice for an offensive hole. It will absolutely be your defensive strip, okay? But if, you have, if you're gonna do this offensively, you would do a minimum of at least 16 feet, okay? Um, but it's really, it's still not, it shouldn't really be what you do. So all that to say, when you're gonna do this application on a panelized roof, it's probably gonna be you're doing a defensive strip and you will be starting it at a bearing wall and you will be going to the other bearing wall or you'll have another truck helping you go bearing wall to bearing wall. Makes sense. Okay, Greg will cover the song. Very professionally, Again, maybe so an F-bomb or two, but he's going to cover the saw work right probably. now. Probably. Okay, so again, we talk about the nonverbal. Steve's going to come here. All right, it's very important in 
unless we have a bearing wall, we're on a skylight defensive trench, we are going to try to go wall to wall, sweet separator to sweet separator, beam to beam, whatever that span is, okay? So we probably have a good indication. When this is applicable is tomorrow, when you might be out in the middle of the FedEx building and you don't have a good landmark, and the cap says, okay, we're far enough based on sounding and my size up, I'm going to drop it right here, okay? So as a slur, what do I have to do? I've got a mark where I'm going to start on that fire side rafter, okay? Whether you top bar back, and go or you switch hands, we don't care. Right? For the indicator cut, you can top bar. We do not cut with the top bar. Got that? Do not cut a whole hole. Do not cut a whole hole. I drop in, I indicate, and I can go. Okay, that's all the top bar we do. Okay? So I'm here. My positioning is I'm mid, I'm center on the purlin. You don't hear us say always and never too much. You are always gonna stay on this purlin. You're gonna stay on this purlin, you're gonna stay on this beam. This is the roof that will kill you if you don't. Okay? When I'm here, I'm centered. I get that good center of gravity, right? I want to reach out to where I'm comfortable, okay? What's the first cut I'm making? A skim cut. What is a skim cut? Skim cut's just the top layer. All I'm doing is cutting the decking, and I've got that for my inspection hole. I know how thick my decking is. Is it one inch, three inches, four inches, six inches? Good luck, okay? <laughs> so I mark that rafter, I turn my saw around. What we don't want to see is you overextending, okay? Because what's going to happen? Oh, you made a bitchin' four-foot hole for how long? This hole, when you do this, you're going a minimum, I guarantee, of 40 feet when you do this in real life. And I guarantee you, who's got two thumbs and has done it before? This guy. Four feet, and it equates to what when I get done? About eight inches. I'm not effective. I've done nothing. So I'd rather see you be more effective. Get, like Steve said, that three feet, okay? And I skim cut. I'm moving along. Am I dragging my saw? This is what we see with you guys. You drop it, and I'm doing what? I'm dragging my saw, okay? One, it's gonna be very difficult to do that. And two, I'm balanced and good right here, yes? Now watch my saw tip if I just push it. How much more room did I just get? I just gave myself another two inches just by good saw mechanics, okay? So today you're gonna find it. You're gonna skim two cells. I come back, I make my fire side parallel. This is where you guys are gonna get screwed up. Because you've done conventional and residential, and if you haven't done this before, what are you gonna do? We do not leave the purlin. Side parallel. This is the other reason why we don't want you overextending that skim cut. You have to intersect these cuts. If you don't, they will not louver. If you over, if you make that first skim cut too far, now you're again overextending. If you need to go out further, I just cut my center of gravity. I can get down on a knee and I can extend my cut. You can do this a lot. <laughs> you don't want to be doing that, okay? Side parallel. I stay six inches, four to six inches off my beams and purlins, right? We don't want more than that. We don't want to be less than that because you're going to R. Cut protection on this prop simulates hangers. Okay, come down here, I make that. I'm making a louver. So what do I have to do when I louver? I roll one, I bump two, stop at two. I'm already in position, side parallel, side parallel, I leave two inches on that rafter, okay? Overlap my cuts, roll one, I stop two, side parallel, okay? Every time you make a louver with construction, against construction, two saws, four saws, whatever it is, we are always going to do what on that base cut? Roll one, stop at two. This way you don't span a rafter and not complete the louver. Also, as a good sawyer, Steve's over here waiting for me. Roll one, I stop two. Side parallel, side parallel, boom, it louvered. He just gets that, he sees that little teeter. I just, boom, it teeters. It means that I have intersected all my cuts and I don't, because here's what's gonna, I mean, today you're gonna do two, right? In real life, side parallel, side parallel, roll one, bump two, side parallel, side parallel, roll one, bump two, side parallel, side parallel, roll one, bump two. That's how fast I'm moving. Steve's giving me a couple cells before he starts louvering. I'm gonna be over here and Steve's gonna be on his second cell going, God damn it, it didn't punch, right? So take your time, today you're only doing two. So we skim, come back, louver, side parallel, side parallel, 
check it. Side parallel, side parallel, check it. Then I'm going to step over here and I'm going to wait for Steve. In my, in my experience, you guys, the, the little panels won't always just, you'll see the dip of it. Yep. Uh, you, it's a good idea to get in the habit of tapping them. But when you when you louver out the big three by sevens, I've always had them be heavy enough that you see them dip, and you know that your cuts are good. That's tomorrow. They they they, they just you they because the weight they move just enough that you know you got it. Okay. All right. So he's louvered these, or he's cut them. I've got to step up and louver them. Use the six foot of your tool. So I like to step up. I basically sound to the middle of that that second um, panel. I step there, I pivot around it, I punch, and I pull back. And I'm back enough, far enough from the hole that if I get nasty conditions out of there, it's not in my face. Rather than louvering from right here. Does that make sense? So I've louvered that one, right? And then I do the same thing. I get to there, foot, pivot, and, and uh, pull up. <clears throat> I've only ever once punched a ceiling on a panelized roof and it was over the office space. <clears throat> and this this wouldn't even have come close to doing it. Your drop ceilings are always gonna be much lower and that's why it's a good idea to bring your longest de-handled tool to a roof. It's probably gonna be a pipe pole, 16, 18, 20 foot pipe pole. That should be coming up on all of these roofs, all of your uh, uh, tr uh, arch roofs. You're probably gonna need a 20 foot or a punch ceiling on a, on a rib truss roof, okay? Okay, right. for the evolution, you're gonna do that. You're gonna punch, you're gonna stand here. You're just gonna swap tools right here and the next guy and the next guy's gonna finish them. Next guy's gonna lube with the next two. Just skim and cut, then you're gonna the roof. Okay, but for me, if this was real, like Steve said, where am I supposed to go? He's my lead hook, right? I know that he sounded at four feet. I can just step down the front. Or he knows he can bump to there. I don't even need to go anywhere. Because he sounded that way, we got that. I can go here, I step here, and I let him lead me. Okay? That makes sense? Yes, yes sir. sir. You're doing that skin cut because you're just doing a skin cut. You're not are you gonna be filling rafters? Okay, no. So you I should not. I'm not steps. saying you're not going to, you shouldn't be, because you're at a 45 degree angle, right? You're only going through the deck. You know what I told you in the saw class? I need surface area to feel the rafter to roll it. If I'm just on top of it and I know I'm just going through the decking. You're going to just skim right across the top of me and you're going to feel it. If you do feel it, yeah, then just kind of rock over it and make sure we cut the deck. You may or may not feel it. You if you do roll it. it. How are you going to know when you hit the two cells to stop that you've gone far enough? For the skim? Correct. That's just for today. That's just for our drill today. Because you can see that in real life. Where am I going? What I say? I'm going to the next bearing wall or the sweet separator or the next beam, which will be very apparent on our roof. Real world. Uh, strip operation, two saws. First saw is going to plunge and skim cut. They're going. They're off to the right. races. Second, second saw is going to step up, move the panels behind them. That first saw may make the other wall if it's if it's 40, 60 feet away. And if they do that and we're still louvering, they'll start louvering back towards us. We'll meet in the middle of the roof somewhere. At that point, then, we break up as a crew. Sawyers plunge their saws in the deck. Because on a strip, we'd like to louver the panels at about the same time, right? If I prematurely start louvering panels and they're not done cutting the strip, as soon as I louver that first panel or two, what am I doing to the fire? I'm drawing it hard, okay? The last thing I want is to get fire coming out of my strip here and we're not done. It's, it's fucking demoralizing. Because this is going to be a lot of work. You're at, by the time you get to the strip cut on one of these roofs, you've probably already done two four offensive louvers, you're spent, okay? So you'll, you will louver out 20, 30 panels, and then if you're up there only as a single truck, you're, you're gonna, each guy's gonna probably have to just punch, you know, five, six panels. And sawyers will plunge their saws, get their axe out. You can louver these three by threes with an axe, no problem. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Anybody so, else? Anything else? Okay, before we begin, uh, Again, like Steve said, do not simulate punching the ceiling, aka don't hit the D handle on the asphalt because it breaks them. Okay? The other thing is if everybody could please grab a sheet of OSP and stage it up against this wall back here before we begin. Six wells, there are six groups, breaking the teams of two, and then have a couple groups here, a couple groups there. 
the two groups that are not working or standing by or after you go will be we'll be like kind of hustling and hollering like hey give me a sheet back out there okay you guys know what you gotta do right from there it's just orchestrated for us to get this done all right we'll keep your guys' dance going everybody's gonna cut twice twice so let's get 12 sheets up here 